Welcome to the Redeemed Vision Podcast, where we bring sight to the blind and freedom to those enslaved by our pornified culture. Here, we dive into hard but important topics such as pornography, sexual identity, true freedom, real love, and living marriage well. Go deep with us as we uncover what Redeemed Vision means for each of us living in the world today. Come to know yourself, the power of redemption through Jesus Christ, the joy of laughter, and how to live in gratitude and wonder. This is Redeemed Vision. Welcome back to another edition of the Redeem Vision podcast. I am your host, Steve Picorni. It is an honor to have you here. Um, as uh, hopefully you're aware, it is still the Christmas season. We are uh, still enjoying the festivities in our house. It has been a uh, it was a very beautiful Christmas uh, Eve celebration. Uh, we celebrate at Three Hierarchs Parish in San Antonio, where uh, we are Eastern Catholic and getting to enjoy. Uh, entering into the birth of Christ. And for those who are unaware, uh, many, uh, many who listen to this are coming from a Roman persuasion. Um, in the East, we like to say Christ is born, and then uh, the response is glorify him. And in fact, on Easter, uh, we say that uh, Christ is risen, and he, we say we respond, Christ is risen indeed. And historically, January 1st, which uh, we just passed, is um, is historically the feast of the circumcision of Christ, which is very weird to many people in that we are uh, many, very uncomfortable about the body, but realizing that God himself came into our world as a little human baby, came in uh, with a body as a male body, and on the eighth day he was circumcised. And so uh, the, uh, the running uh, joke in the East is Christ is circumcised, and we respond with, Snip him, or ouch, we're not sure exactly. But um, anyway, a little little humor there to start with. Um, it's an honor having you here. And uh, one other point is a lot of people, when they start off these, this time of the year, they start off January 1st making resolutions. I don't think resolutions are necessarily bad, but sometimes January 3rd rolls around and maybe you're there already. We're like, well, that didn't work. And we slough off and we don't make any resolutions at all. And so I think one of the issues is, a year is a little too long. So what I would encourage you is to break your year into four 12-week years. There's a, actually a, a, a book called The 12-Week Year, and this is where I'm pulling this from. And basically, four 12-week years in which you set a big goal, a genuinely big goal, something that's going to stretch you for 12 weeks. And that's your year in the last, last week of that quarter is either for mop-up, for getting, getting the rest done, or for celebration, right? And so I think this is going to be this can be a, a little more manageable for a lot of people who are trying to overcome some sort of, of compulsion. They're trying to deal with something that maybe a workout plan. Uh, maybe I want better communication with my spouse. Those different things. So something you may want to look at here that can very much um, help. So maybe twelve weeks. Start with that, and I've got to just push through to the end of March. So what is that that thing that you need to work on? set a plan, something that stretch you, stretches you, and go get it. Now, before we go any further, I want to sh share with you one of our uh, one of our partners. This is Hallow. Hallow is the number one app for Catholic meditation and prayer to sleep better, to find peace, to come into union with God. And, and we believe, again, in Christmas that Christ came down and was present to us. And if you go to hallow.com forward slash freedom coaching, when you sign up, um, you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get three months of free um, free service on there, and then as you continue to do that, it's gonna support the work of freedom coaching. So with that said, I want to introduce you to our guest today, who I'm very very excited. Uh, I was I was thrilled to be able to meet this gentleman uh, a couple months back at an event known as Made for More with one of our other future uh, future guests. He'll perhaps be on again, but former guest Christopher West. Uh, I encourage you to check out the interview there and also on the Theology of the Body channel. And um, his name is Mike Mangione, and he grew up in Glenville, Illinois, um, and this is right outside of Chicago. And um, he's an American singer, songwriter, guitarist, percussionist, um, 
He currently leads the band Mike Mangione and the Kinth. So it's an orchestral folk group. And he also works with his brother, keeping it in the family there. And uh, one of his um, uh, one of his albums, The Red Winged Blackbird Man, was given four stars for its release by American Songwriter Magazine. It's a pretty big thing. Uh, Mike has also been featured in the, uh, I guess it's a classic in, in some circles, uh, of Anchorman uh, as an, un, uh, he didn't have a speaking role, but an impactful part on there. And, but his most important impact is that Mike currently lives in Wisconsin with his wife and three children. And Mike, welcome to the Redeem Vision podcast. How are you today? Doing good. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. An honor, an honor to have you. And and Mike, as I um as I was expressing in the introduction there, um, I was genuinely moved. Uh, and and I think I, I think I, I saw you years ago. I think it was it was back here in San Antonio. I think in 2016, you just came back. And um, but I think I maybe I was just because I was closer and I wasn't uh, involved with any of the running of the event. Just taking yeah. in and getting to soak in the event. Um, so I want to thank you for for the work you're doing, for your your yes in allowing um, allowing God to work in and through the work there. And, and we'll get into that story, but I, I want to make sure I say that before we uh, before we get off uh, any further in the interview, because I would be remiss um, of how impactful that evening was. And we'll talk more about uh, that event there. So. Sure. I want to show. I'm going to throw out. A, I don't know if this is a softball question, but and maybe not. But it's a three three word question. Okay, Mike. What is music? What is music? Music is something fun to do with the air. Mm. That's what it is. Um, that was Tom Waits once said that at his uh, Rock and Roll Induction Hall of Fame speech. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean. It's an, it's a form of expression that uses uh, material um, that allows um, humans to to add accompaniment to their reflection on what it means to be human. <laughs> it's an opportunity to engage people. It's an opportunity for communion mm -hmm. with between a performer and audience. Um, it's a means of prayer, mm -hmm. of reflection, of contemplation. Um, so a lot of that stuff I think would fall under the answer of, um, it's, it's a part of human reflection. Mm. Um, I think that, I think that works for me, uh, with no, um, no notice. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, no. And, and, full, and full disclosure, um, I, I very rarely do I give the questions beforehand. I mean, if, if, uh, if guests want to throw that out. So yeah, you're, you're welcome for that. Um, yeah. A little full, a little philosophy um, to, to at the top of our discussion here. And I think that's important. And I, I think like just thinking back over the past three years, how life has just been radically uh, interrupted, obviously your work. And, and I, I think, I mean, anyone who has any semblance of, of what goes into creating music and the performance of music and myself, I, I have a background in music uh, literacy to a degree. And um, there's a big difference between listening to the recording of something, which can be so good and so powerful, but to being in the room, there's nothing like it. Right. Yeah. And, and, and soaking in that. And, and in fact, I mean, maybe even over, over the past, you know, those past three years were a lot in a lot of places, at least for a year, things locked down, things cut off here. I think that the need for human connectivity has been critically, critically important. So how would you, you know, even what, where was your music and the, and the work that you were doing? Um, th let's just talk about it. Let's, let's go there with, with things being locked down, things being shut down. How did that impact you? Um, and you impact your craft and maybe coming out of that, how do you see that um, impacting it going forward? Well, there's a very practical way in which it was impacted and that, you know, obviously like everything stopped. So like any mm -hmm. kind of, you know, music is all about, um, professional music is all about momentum and you kind of do things that build off of each other, just like many things. So, you know, when everything locked down, all that m momentum stopped, I had a band that was right on the right starting to kind of dissipate a little bit that the pandemic just really kind of pushed over the edge mm -hmm. i also had um a bunch of song ideas 
for a new record that I just didn't have time to record that a pandemic enabled me to do. So I was able to, you know, I, I was impacted in that I, I, I stopped playing, um, mm. uh, but you know, and, and also like, thankfully I had, I'm the event director for the Institute. So I was able to still do something, uh, to be productive and all, you know, to make a living. Um, but we got, even at the Institute, we got creative, you know, we started, we started to look more online. Um, it kind of forced our hands at online education, which was a God, which was great because we needed to be there anyway. Um, I got a, musically, I got a lot more involved with videos, a lot more. Um, I, I went through an old catalog of stuff that I recorded and put out an EP. So I kind of like scrounged together something that wouldn't have been released otherwise. Um, so, you know, even though it was, was it three years of just kind of weird staleness, uh, I really, I recorded and released a full length record and, and record and released an EP. So I try to be productive, but, uh, performance wise, everything stopped. And so I actually just got to the point, I feel like where I'm back to my playing weight, if you will, for performance, I feel comfortable again, but it took a while. Yes. It took a, yeah. it took a long time. Yeah, absolutely. No, so. and, and that and by the way, that that question was kind of unscripted, kind of popped up there. And I think we we've all had to adapt, all had to had to move here, um, and, and figure out how is the best way that we're going to to reach out. But but we were yeah. never meant. I mean, the, the best thing we could do, Mike, is to be in the same room, to be sharing this, to, to be in the flesh, to be present is always is always the better experiences. It, it changes the dichotomy of relationships and, and hopefully it should change them for the better, right? That's, we're meant to connect, we're meant to do that, right? And, and that's what one thing that I, I'm i so grateful for the work that the Theology of Body Institute is doing and, and to all those who are hearing this, if you have not checked out the work of the Theology of Body Institute, please don't uh, don't hesitate to head over there today to check out the good work they're doing that Mike is a part of there. So I wanna go back here, Mike. Mm -hmm. I want to I want to go back here and love, I'd love you to just give us a little bit of insight into you growing up. What what would you say was your earliest memory where music affected you? Earliest memory um probably probably the in the house, the the music that was played um mm. my my mom and my dad, particularly my dad always loved adding music to to just adding music to things just to kind of embellish the senses and em embellish a moment. So, you know, um, he, he really had a good understanding of this is a good music for this moment. And, um, you know, so it was common to be with family and then all of a sudden you notice the music flips on and my dad walks into the room cause he had just <laughs> taken care of the ambiance, you know, um, that was my earliest but I was actually, I just got a text from my mom this morning where she mm -hmm. said, uh, she's, what did she say? She said, um, which I appreciate this. She says, I just realized that because of your anger was why I got you into drums. So mm. uh, music was also a part of controlling my anger. I was the youngest <laughs> of, of three boys. And so my mom just confirmed that. Uh, she got me into drums in first grade because I was hitting my brothers too much. So, so instead, of, instead of punching through a wall, punch this drum set metaphor or literally. It's exactly, <laughs> it's exactly right. And then what was cool is that my brothers started playing guitars. So music actually brought us together, um, mm. which is great. Instead of keeping me busy, you know, brought us busy, busy together. So that, I think that was, that was it. You know, I had drum lessons at a very young age and I just remember being, I remember being confused uh, by, by, by getting theoretical with music. And I remember, um, I remember being confused by the, uh, the extreme difference between the feeling of experiencing music and the feeling of trying to understand it theoretically. They're completely opposite ends. One was a place of peace and rest. One was hot and confusion. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I remember that early on, and I remember that was a good lesson in the nature of things. Um, yeah. So try, try. let me let me let me jump in here. This is yeah. this is fascinating, um, and I think this is another reason why I have people on the podcast because I get to learn I get to learn so much, which is beautiful. So 
So you have theoretical versus the practical, if I heard that correctly. And yeah. how would you how would you reconcile those two then? Well, for, for me personally, yeah. it's understanding. It's like, what's the better vocation? Hmm. Religious life or marriage? Hmm. And the answer is the better vocation is the one in which you're called to. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, one could argue, no, religious life is the holier of vocations. Well, not if you're called to be a husband and a father, mm -hmm. then it's not at all. So um, I, I would, the, the way I apply that is, is it's important, I think, as, a, as a somebody who creates to understand not only the ways in which you come close to the perfected uh, theory and the perfected practice of, of, of a creation, but also as important is understanding your weaknesses and, and, and brokenness mm. so that you can lean into them and work with them to do your best possible work. And I, I think that it's the brokenness that really kind of defines our style. So a lot of people think if I perfect these practices that have been perfected for generations, then I will become better at my craft. And the reality is, no, you'll become better at emulating the perfect form, but we know that the perfect form is not possible. What you need to be doing is understanding those and applying them to the broken qualities that you possess as a human artist mm -hmm. so that you can develop your own style. You know, it's like, it's like um, Pollock wasn't perfecting the practices he learned and, you know, it's like it's cliche that yeah, I, I I went to art school and learned nothing, and then I you know <laughs> saw a street performer and everything, or like Bruce Lee, like in the hospital bed, you know, like studying studying the the traditions of his martial art and seeing all of the loopholes in which, you know, in which he got defeated because he was following tradition, but then he started reflecting on what came naturally to him as an as a human being, and he was able to kind of cut out some of the fluff. And perfect his personal uh, adaptation of that martial art through his weakness, and then he developed Jeet Kune Do, his own his own art form. So, you know, Tom Waits is another example. I mentioned him already, like with his voice, or Bob Dylan with their voice. It's like if you go by standards of of perfection, then those guys never had a chance. But if you understand that our brokenness, I mean, it's theological because it's through our brokenness that the Lord enters in and illuminates. So it's through our brokenness that as an artist, if you open it up, uh, your vulnerability up to a, a higher understanding, I will make it even like less theological, just a higher that you are part of something bigger, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. If you open it up to that, then the salve is able to come in and work with the ways in which you fail to make it something completely new that's never been that that can't be done any other way because of the unique qualities of yourself as an artist so um i don't i can't remember how i got on that but oh no, oh, oh so i balance the two in understanding that <clears throat> well this is this is what i love and it's not even like perfect it's not even like i'm trying to emulate perfection it's also like i'm trying to emulate um some of the people that I look up to and even in their brokenness that I'm emulating, I'm still falling short. So I need to be comfortable with that understand, well, this is how, this is what a Bob Dylan song sounds like in 1976. This is what a Mike Mangione song sounds like in 2022 after being inspired by that Bob Dylan song. So it's, it's all part of a, um, it's, it's a living thing and it's changing and it's, um, it's a living thing. And the best artists understand that because they understand. And the, okay, the best artists, I think, understand that because they understand the moves they need to make as they change with age. Mm. You see some artists like I'm a huge U2 fan. But I don't think in my personal opinion, so U2 fans out there, you don't need to hate me for saying this. In my <laughs> oh. personal my personal experience of being a 43-year-old male that has watched them my whole life, I don't feel like they've adapted with the broken things that they're, the broken human qualities that they're going through as older men. Mm. 
Mm. And they're applying kind of a youthful approach to art, in my opinion, that is not working well with the material they currently possess. In other words, playing pop songs when you're 63 years old and you're not necessarily, you're not making a more suitable song for your maturity into a pop song. Mm -hmm. You're simply just trying to create a pop song using the standards of youth to me it just falls it falls and so like in a, another example would be i've named them already but like van morrison or mm -hmm. dylan mm -hmm. you know people that like take dylan for example you know in in 1997 he came out and said all right well i've kind of been always pegged as this old this old gravelly voice guy so i might as well lean into that i love blues I come from this traditional Americana, so I'm going to lean into uh, these older kind of songs that lend itself to the voice that I currently have so that the greater the whole makes more sense. And sure enough, he won his first Grammy doing that. So not that that means anything, but, you know, if it, if it means anything, that's a good time to let it mean what it means. All right, so uh, Mike, tons of things here. So you're 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 throwing me throwing me that my my brain is exploding just a bit here. Especially, I could talk forever. I, I so, love it. I okay. love it. It's it's beautiful. Um, so a, a couple of things I'm I'm hearing coming here is is a, a lot of the ideas. And I think this is just the and we talk about this in, in in our work we do with freedom coaching, but it's in, in our podcast and and it's the Instagram, it's the social media uh world that we're living in we try and, and some of this was captured especially very well at the made for more event with christopher and how we we want we think perfection is merely of the youth that perfection is hiding our flaws and not yeah. not uh not like don't show any of your cracks and then like and, and then if we bring in the the beauty industry the, like the even just makeup and all, and all of that going in there right but i think one of the one of the important phrases you're saying that I'm gonna I'm gonna want to jump off here in a minute is how we are perfected by our, in and through and by our brokenness, right? Which is just which is for uh, those of us who have think we're in control, we're never in control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've we've never we're, we're we're not we're not okay. I'm not okay. You're not okay, and it's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Realizing that here. So from the Bruce Lee of music, Mike Mangione, shall we say, right? The language that you're communicating here that's I think most importantly is the best kind of artists. I, I this is the way I would put it. So correct me if I'm wrong, is you gotta know where the rules are. And I think that's where music theory comes in, that's where the study does come in, the late nights of study and exams if you're gonna go to you know uh, professional music school, shall we say. Um, but then it's it's I, the image in my head. I'm a I'm a huge baseball fan, right? And congrats to you know uh, Philadelphia Phillies getting the National League there, and the Astros winning it all um, this past year. And um, but you've got to know where the boundaries are. You got to know where the foul poles are. But then in the midst of that craft, as you're doing that, you're going to get your swing style. You're going to get to know how to hit that right. So then in the in the midst of music here, right? I know I know all the I can play all the chords. I can play all the scales. But then there's improvisation. I think that's another reason why, if you're taking just the, the one genre of, of of jazz, right? They ha they know those things, and then and then they're able to really flow with that. And and there's a beauty that comes from that, right? And you, and you hit off one last thing, talking about you two and and Bono, uh, for instance, st trying to stay popish, shall we say, and simply wanting to um, impress the youth. And the, the idea is the beauty is only found in the youth. It's only found in the young. And I, like the the one other uh, pop person that popped in my head, uh, pun intended, is Cher. Right? The, I think the last magazine is Cher, seventy two year, years old, being sexy. I'm like, I don't want to know anything about that kind of lifestyle with Cher right now. I'm actually yeah. or anyone, shall we say, right? Because um, I, I think there's there's a beauty in humanity itself. And yeah. So so my question to you, Mike moving forward from this right you you're you've got this passion that has exploded out of you and it comes obviously your your canvas that you use is 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 music and it's and it's profound and and it can be said that said that a lot of artists their passions come from a place of pain and you you mentioned the term woundedness right and hurts 
So if you're willing to get a little bit of spirit, spiritually naked here, right? What kind of wounds would you say were opened for you when you were growing up that, that really impacted you and, and would develop in with your in and through your musical abilities? Well, um, the first thing that popped in my head was the word wounds. To me, that seemed um, mm -hmm. a little too specific. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, what 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 resonates more is um, questions. You know, and I think like wounds can cause questions, right? Mm -hmm. That that we desire to be answered and figured out, um, but but that works better for me because at the early age that I was authentically impacted by music, I didn't really have many wounds. Uh, I was young, you know, I, 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 if you asked me, I would have told you, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, my dad was mean to me and I didn't make the volleyball team. Like those are my wounds. But, but really what, what music did for me was it enabled me to, to hang in the, the balance of the conversation that has been happening since the beginning of time. And that's the conversation of what it means to be human. Who am I? What am I? Where am I going? That every cave painting and every or orchestral piece and every street performance piece is begging to, to talk about the human mystery. That's what it's all about. And um, so music early on, kind of suspended me in that in that place so that I could um, participate in a conversation that was that society would have said I was way too young for. So, mm. you know, at, at a time of being 16, when you have all these emotions, no, at least for me, right, not every 16 year old, but I had a ton of emotions, very little problems. Mm. But despite the combination led to me just feeling out of place um, and on my own, even though I had friends and I was social and I played sports, I just felt alone because I was trying to answer these questions that were just innately in me. Uh, mm -hmm. Music was an opportunity for me to, to kind of listen to what other people had to say about it. And uh, it made me feel not so crazy. And it made me feel like there was a place for this kind of language. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Early on, very early on, I'm talking like fifth grade, um, I was only listening to artists of contemplation, you know, artists of like reflection. And, you know, I did have a few people that I listened to at the time that were like totally current. Um, but for the most part, I was listening to songwriters and um, uh, and and really just trying to enter into the spiritual side meaning that reflective side of what it means to be human of music right away because that's like what that's where i that's where i fully came like my brain fully um just came alive when i sat in songs by like peter gabriel like mm. peter gabriel's two records in in the in the 80s so and us um mm -hmm. are are so incredibly rich it's like taking a bite of like uh, music is like taking a bite of a, 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 a like a McDonald's burger, and then like Peter Gabriel's like a gourmet burger, where like every <laughs> every bite has just this complex yes. fl these complex flavors. So mm. that right away, like when I heard that, I was like, okay, this is mm. something beyond just rhyming. This is telling. This is this is using words to put people in a in a specific place that he wants you to be to to take in the experience so mm -hmm. I don't okay know. Couple, couple, i got a comment on this um yeah. that um 20 years ago my grandfather passed away and um I, yeah t t this year is 20 years and a friend of mine um we were together when i i got the news and um he gave me a disc uh, and we were driving separate we we're going to go in going to an event and he just gave me this disc he said pop it in uh, go to i think it was i think it was track five if i have it on have a correct on the disc and it's peter gabriel's i grieve mm. and just the my grandfather was so, so important to me uh in, in, in being a, fa a major father figure in my life and and, and being able to, to guide me and showing that impact of of faith 
Um, and then to have that absence, absence there. And I think the two of us had kind of, um, had, there'd been kind of a, a space that entered into our relationship. And then now he's gone and I can't, on this side of eternity, I can't, um, I can't share that with him. And, and so Peter's words communicated through that and, and just this, um, I, I'm not gonna do it justice if I try to sing it right now, because it's been a little time since I've heard it, but just this, this wailing of the soul. Mm. That's what, that's what I would, I just, it just resonated with me. It just broke me. And I'm, I'm crying as I'm driving. Thank God for my guardian angels taking care of me. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I, I resonate deeply with, with uh, Peter Gabriel's and, and obviously, you know, in your eyes, I would say is a big, uh, a big, uh, big message, especially in the work that we're doing here to help people to see critically important. So, yeah, um, you know what, one song too that you're listening if your listeners are obviously into like reflecting on this kind of stuff and what it yeah. means to you know a, a great song to start with would be blood of eden mm. um when i got into tob i was already a big peter mm. gabriel fan and it's funny people often when i was first getting into my faith so i was like 2021 20, mm -hmm. and i was already into music um so many times i'd encounter people that said yeah when i had my conversion or whatever rebirth or whatever um and i got rid of all my old music and i remember being like wait what what <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah i got i got rid of all my all my music so now i'm you know just because it was it was evil and it made me mm -hmm. it made me feel this way and i remember being so cute confused by that i'm not i wasn't judging i was just confused because that was not my experience what my experience was, was when I got into my faith, all my old music made sense. Mm. How, it, how so? T tell us more about that. Well, because, because they were like, I, now I was listening to music that really, like I said, reflected on the human mystery. Right. And mm. I didn't totally understand it. I just knew that it felt warm, mm. but you know, I, I kind of, when I got into my faith, I had this, you know, I, I kind of encountered this group that felt like, well, no, if you don't know the if you don't know the religious background of the individual creating the artifact, then then you shouldn't be messing with the artifact because it could potentially lead you into an unsafe area of thought or action. And that's not what I was experiencing. What I was experiencing was that all of the old music now with this new understanding of the echo and the heart, the human mystery. Um, you know what how we're actually designed to be um really like we are given these desires as a gift from god and they're actually meant to draw us closer to god that mm. alone that alone that these desires that were given to us were planted in us by our creator mm. and are meant to when properly used bring us closer to the creator if you understand that reality now go listen to all the old music from the past Yes. Because even the music in which you don't agree with what they're talking about, they're talking about it because it's in an innate desire. So <clears throat> John, then John Paul II in 1999, April 4th, wrote Letter to Artists. Yes. Where he paraphrases, I, I don't know the exact quote, but he reflects on that point that even when we're talking about the creator, even when the creation begins to lament about the agony involved in life they are still reflecting on creation as a whole therefore mm. they are still like entering into a prayer of agony <laughs> rather than a it's not oh it doesn't always have to be a prayer of ecstasy we don't always have to be praising we also have to be reflective and contemplate the the sorrows and the brokenness my god my god why have you forsaken me like we have to have those moments in our life and art that reflects on that is useful. That's what John Paul II was saying. And now that then the key comes down to this, what's the intention of the artist? If the intention of the artist is to enter into that conversation and have that conversation with themselves, with their band and with the audience, then it's a pure intention and is in, in its own way, a, re, a prayer. But if the intention is to simply just show off the material of the artist and make themselves creator and make themselves have the, the artifact begin and end with their abilities and their ability to shock you and, you know, 
then um, it becomes almost it becomes pornographic where it starts and stops with the artifact and it doesn't transcend. Um, yeah. No, I, thank you. No, I don't know why I'm talking about this. <laughs> no, oh, I know why you're talking about it because we're 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 t we're touching on the. This is not about going staying on the surface. We want oh, to right. go deep here. This is this is this is very very important, and, and I think a, a message that's that's I'm hearing it's been communicated very well by you, Michael, is is that notion, especially if all of us, in a certain sense, whether we're musicians or whether we're you're, whether you're a housewife or whatever, we're called to be artists in the life that we God is God lives here, and not every experience is going to be the Christmas season. There's going to be a season of pain, right? There's the beauty of the liturgical seasons of entering into this. And, and whether it's a prayer of praise or a prayer of agony, whatever it is, don't run from the pain. I think yeah. that's an important uh, important element. And, and that's what I've, I've caught just the little bit I've gotten to know you and know some of your music. I think you capture that well, Michael. And I, I, wanna, I wanna thank you for that. And, and the encouragement to everyone hearing this, don't suffocate the pain. Don't run from it. Open it up wherever you are. Be real. Open that reality up. And, and, and that, that's a, a beautifully said. And I think this is where the errors of, of secular music come in. It doesn't mean that secular music doesn't have something to teach us as we're, we're talking here. This isn't so you want to it's, it's what St. Paul says, you know, test everything, retain what's good. Is there good in, in you choose music? There is. Are they off on some of things? Yeah, I would say on some of their messaging. In, in a certain sense. But what we can find is they're trying to tap into something real about the human experience. Can yeah. we hear it from that perspective and be able to bring it out here, right? Some of the stuff, right, uh, you know, if we want to bring out like uh, certain artists like like Rihanna, for instance, if I'm going to pick on her, right? Some of the stuff, there is no transcendence whatsoever. It's simply about mere titillation of the senses of se uh, sensuality that does not uplift the soul to beyond ourselves beyond us to god but instead keeps us trapped into mere mere baseness and and that itself will will swallow us and bring us into darkness mm -hmm. and i think that's so so for yourself i mean let me ask that question michael in um in your your process of of, of growing of, of having these emotions you're growing up and, and developing your own skills we're what has helped you to battle through the darkness and in, in to, to open that up to the transcendence? What is what has that experience been for you? If, again, that's a kind of a general question, so I'll let you have at it. Yeah, I would say the example of other people doing it before me has mm -hmm. been the most impactful. Um, you know, it's like it, it it's like why why do we why does the idea of when we're like sad at least for me, some of you people may be like, that doesn't sound nice at all. But like <laughs> the idea of like driving down a dark highway with like a song that matches the vibe. Mm. It's like therapeutic, you know, yes. like I need to get out. Like there's moments in my house where I'm just like, you know, and I kind of live in the country. I'm like, I'm just going to go down. I for a little bit and you just jump on. I and just put the music on. So, um, you know, it, 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 it has that ability to um, to just kind of match, to fill in what we need. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it's a solve. Um, yeah. I'm, as you're as you're talking, I'm thinking. You know, driving down the highway, I'm thinking Tom Petty. Tom Petty uh, running down a dream, or even yeah. uh, uh, won't back um, down. Don't back down. Yeah, to totally. Like, and that's, like, in our heart of hearts as men, right? We we want to face this battle. We have this battle. We want to we want to go after this adventure. I mean, I'm I'm quoting John Eldridge here in a certain sense, and the beauty to rescue, and we we long for this. And and in the fight there, we want to stand up to that, right? We want to go up against the darkness, and we want to be successful, right? But if we if we aren't, and I think this is this kind of circles back to the um, back to uh, our earlier conversation, our earlier part of this conversation in in that we uh, we got to know the principles of of the art we got to know how to enter into that so we can by being who we are we bring our life experiences in here this is how we create something new and i think the error of a lot of artists and correct me if i'm wrong is they they, they want to scrub and I, I think this is part of the postmodern world we're in where we want to dismantle anything that came in the past anything that came in the past is is bad only that the 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 youth the young 
that's what's important. And, and Mike, apparently you and I, we share the same uh, birth year. I'm, uh, I'm a 43 year old uh, gentleman as well. And so, um, so I think from, are you 79 or 80? 79. There you go. I'm, I'm August. So there we go. So I'm July. All right. I yeah, got okay. You. All right. So I'm your, I'm your, I'm your, I'm, I'm sitting at the foot of the master as, as a yes, young yes. protege. Learn from me, learn from me. <laughs> exactly. And, um, but, but from that is, is where it becomes um, destructive is again, if it's not opened up into that transcendence, if it's not, if we don't learn from the past and instead we want to tear it all down, that whole notion of, as we're seeing in economics, especially build back better, destroy it all because the, the past has nothing to teach us. But I think we, we, that's mere hubris and that's mm. going to get us into, I mean, that's, that's, that's what comes before the fall. That's what destroyed Satan and will, what will destroy us. So for you, and, and then this is a, this is an important question. Again, you, you have, I think six albums out currently, right? You probably have done other things as well. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that good? Okay. I think and, six studio, studio full length records, but there's like EPs out. There. Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. And, and, and maybe we'll have to have a conversation about one of my favorite bands in the whole world, Switchfoot at some point, but, but from here, um, like with, with that and putting that, that stuff out there, you get to a certain of, I mean, people know you, right? There's a, there's elements of fame, things like that. Oh. As an artist, how do you keep that checked? What, what do you do? What do you do with that when people are knowing and things are growing? Cause there's a part of us, right? As, you know, I want to get this message out. It's really important. Um, and, and to, 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 um, to push back against any of the, uh, the accoutrements uh, of the negative aspect of fame that it really becomes self-seeking. How do you, what's been effective for you in that regard? If I'm going to be honest, I, it, just the reality of what comes with this lifestyle keeps it pretty in check. I mean, like, I, first off, I don't, I don't consider, I don't think I'm famous by any stretch. Um, I, I've had, it's kind of funny. I've had m m on multiple occasions, people have asked me if I'm famous, <laughs> which is just, which is just a great question. Um, one, one woman out when I was in Austria said, what's it like to be famous? And I said, well, did you know me before uh, tonight's concert? She said, no. I said, well, then I'm not the person to ask. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but, um, but, okay, to your point, I am in a, in a position for, for 15 years where I've been in front of a lot of people doing something that I'm pretty good at. Um, so that has led for just by nature of numbers, a lot of people to know me. <laughs> Doesn't mean they like me, but they know me. So, mm -hmm. um, but my my original answer was, um, you know, you're, you're fame is weird, and I, I feel even weird saying it because I, I again I don't consider myself famous, but in some circles, people more people know me, and you know, it's like um, when I was younger, and it really started, people really started, you know, you'd walk into somewhere and people would know of you. Right away, it feels nice. Hmm. Um, and then soon after, it feels like you're being affirmed. Like, yes, like the hard work that I've done is 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 paying off. But soon after, you realize that the people, that kind of fame is, is one that's more of association rather than craft. Hmm. So for me, I used to love after shows or after events, uh, whether I'm doing my own thing or with Christopher, to just run out and get out to the merch table and just engage with people. I used to love doing that, uh, admittedly, because it was it felt good to have people want to talk to you. But um, I do like that still. But what I've found is that um, it's more about there's an excitement because of what they what they just the association like. Um, you're at you're at a festival and you're playing with bands that are very big and so they just like the idea that they're talking to somebody that has access to that world mm -hmm. or with theology of the body like you know um they want to like a person will want to talk to me because they love the fact that i'm like i like travel with christopher or something you know and it's to me right away it's like that's not i'm not i'm not special i'm not famous but when somebody wants to talk about a song that I've written that years ago had an impact 
then I'm interested because it took me a lot of time and a lot of thought to develop that song. So to kind of get some kind of feedback on how it landed and where the roots went is just complete great. Like uh, that I love. And it's completely for solely like I had an idea of how I wanted this to impact people. Now I get to hear how it impacted people. So it's kind of like the end of the cycle. So I love that. Mm, um, that's beautiful. Yeah. But, but yeah, as far as the other thing, it's like, I don't, I don't experience that personally. Well, well, hopefully we can um, appropriately Michael uh, to make you famous. So this message can get out even more. And I think that's, that's especially um, it'd be what you've entered into is a form, what we call just of it's ministry. It's, it's genuine ministry because we're dealing with so many people are so deeply wounded, especially in the realm of sexuality, of, mm. of identity, of giving voice. I have this ache. I've had this hurt. I don't know how to articulate it. And then I, I encounter this song that is, is putting clothing, shall we say, say flat, flesh on the bones of my pain, right? To get to to get uh, creative with the, the language there, and this is somebody who gets me, yeah. and, and 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 then instead of instead of it being uh, that, shall we say that the point of act, pornographic kind of, of of view that some artists put off that it's all about them, you're saying here's the song that's to point you to something greater to actually to find an answer to enter into, not that it's not the song that the song is going to solve all my problems, but to know it's like it's like the incarnation that I'm not here to solve all your problems, sir, but I'm here to be with you. And that, in essence, actually solves the problems to a certain degree. Yeah, I, I would even go a step further and say, mm -hmm. you know, it's like <clears throat> it's like anytime you walk into a messy room and you or you have like a ton of work, you feel overwhelmed. But it's you, sometimes you need that person to step into the room or look at your itinerary and say, no, 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 let's just organize this. Here you go. Let's just categorize these thoughts, these these artifacts, these things, put them in order so that we can properly see them so that you can understand what you're up against, assess, and then make your next move. And that, you know, a lot of the time, like my wife is like that. She'll come in and do that. And then all of a sudden I see the room differently. I'm like, I know how to I know how to tackle this room. I feel like artists do the same thing where they're not always necessarily giving you answers. They're just helping you organize your thoughts so you can properly see them and, 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 and feel okay. You know, it's like, not, it's not like a breakup song is making you not hurt about the breakup. You're always going to hurt about the breakup. The breakup song is letting you know that number one, you're not crazy. Number two, <laughs> you're not alone. Number three, things are going to be okay. And like, once you realize that you go to that breakup song for resolution mm -hmm. and for like, to help you like move past it. And eventually you do move past it, you know? So I always felt like music uh, for me, at least just kind of helps me. You like theology of the body. When I first learned theology of the body, it wasn't putting new concepts in my head. It was naming and organizing the concepts I already had so that I was like, Oh, this actually does make sense. I know this to yes. be true so it's yes. like music to me it's like oh it will be okay i'm not alone okay yes. or you know or hey i feel good too let's dance you know like it doesn't always have to be like how do i deal with my sadness like it can also be like hey by the way you should move your feet right now here you go <laughs> you know <laughs> it can be both and it doesn't have to be so heavy <laughs> I want to, I want to, I want to pinpoint something uh, to get a little, you know, spiritual naked with those who are listening to this. Um, I, I did four years of seminary, three years undergrad, one year major. And in between that, uh, my third year and going to major theology, <clears throat> I met a girl at a retreat and uh, she had uh, brown curly hair, great smile. Our license plates rhymed. It must mean something, right? And um, so but I'm in, <laughs> it must it, the universe is speaking to me, right? And <laughs> um, and I I didn't tell her this, but I spent nine months. I was pregnant with the idea of loving her. I wrote letters that I held on to, and then I did one of the worst things ever. And I unloaded them as I you know discovered that like I, I think I'm called to leave seminary, and she had no interest whatsoever, Michael. Mm. So I'm. I'm driving down the road and, and I've gotten infatuated with you too during this time. And um, with or without you. And I'm just 
pounding on my steering wheel at like 12.30, 1 a.m. to drive, driving home from various events. Just let me let her go. And the ache and the hurt, and I can't do it. I'm stuck in this, this, I'm stuck in this moment I can't get out of, right? That mm -hmm. also was very, very popular at that time. And, and I don't know what to do. But I, I think if we, <laughs> and, and I think this is the difference between um, someone who, you know, we use the term in the addict, the stoic, the addict, and the mystic, right? Of instead of trapping that and trying to just stay stay in the, in the feeling itself and to worship the feeling instead mm -hmm. of where is that feeling genuinely pushing me into what is true, good, beautiful, and unifying? Where is that, is that opening there? When we can do that, then I think what that does, Mike, it helps us become more human. And the, and the more that we tap into that pain and that wounds, realize, okay, I don't have it all together. What that allows us to do is actually to empathize with others, which brings us back to the fact why live music is so darn important. Mm -hmm. Why getting out to your shows in person to see this is so darn important because it's this, this, <laughs> this participation of a created reality into an uncreated reality that there's a song that we're all called to enter and may maybe multiple songs i'm sure i'm sure of it right but we are allowed to participate in god's creation knowing following those rules and those designs that allow us to create something even better mm -hmm. so um thank you for for that articulation critically critically important and then one other point i i uh, i want to bring up and i mentioned about the term fame here mike um you're married You've got a wife and three kids. I'm certain that after we're done talking, there's going to be things you're going to have to deal with, just like I have to, right? Um, and how do you, as an as an artist, so uh, one of the last questions here in this segment, how do you, as an artist, keep that you know that that work and and life balance? How do you do that? Um, or what helps you? I should say. What what. Really quick, one thing I want to mention, mm -hmm. going back to the fame thing, mm -hmm. um, two things. The first thing was, I, I've always thought it was funny in the Catholic fame. It was funny because we believe in the real presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people <laughs> like getting excited to see like Scott Hahn or Chris Stefanik and like behind mm -hmm. him is a tabernacle. <laughs> like the most that. famous person ever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that's number one. Number two, uh, my 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 kids call it fame ish. <laughs> Daddy's. How do they define that? It's a ish. <laughs> so, so, um. Anyway, uh, what was the question again? Wait, wait how do you balance? maintain that balance? The balance of oh, work yeah. and life. It, you know, you know, for me, the uh, the biggest thing was realizing that it's it's not a balance. It's it's life, mm -hmm. and work comes after. <laughs> That's like there, there obviously are those times where it's like, OK, you need to like create your zone to get work done. You need to be consistent in, in your output to like, you know, practically make a living. But as far as the passion goes, uh, the passion is family. And, um, you know, I, I've had kids now for 12 years, 12 and a half years. She would want me to tell you um, so 12 and a half years. And. You know, in the beginning, in the beginning, I had this kind of mindset of, well, I made a vow. We made a commitment at the altar. So that's that can't go anywhere. Mm. Work, art, music will go away if I don't attend. I don't need to attend the family because it's going to stay there by law. <laughs> <laughs> I don't if I don't attend the work, then it dissipates and goes away. And so I put all my time into work and I found out, and I think like, that's a very common thing. I know Christopher mm -hmm. had this moment. Um, so, but yeah, I found out, you know, that through a vocal wife and through many, many nights that that's just not going to fly. So for me, mm -hmm. it's not a ballot. It's a ballot. It's a, it's a hundred percent family that my work, my work sits within that schedule. Um, uh, and then I, I just, make myself open to inspiration and make an effort then once inspired to find those pockets then to fill in. But, you know, occasionally I'll go travel somewhere to write and that has an impact on the family. But, you know, there, there, I tell you, man, I look at my schedule 
Like we're going to us, we're going to New Zealand and Australia in January next month. Wonderful. Yeah. And you know, I had an opportunity to stick around and, and play more shows, but uh, it, the, the, the 25 year old me would be like, yeah, freaking go tour Australia and live it up. But the 43 year old dad of me and husband said, ask your wife. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you're getting so, wiser, Michael. Getting wiser. Yeah, and and I, we looked at the schedule and it was like, dude, you know, 10, 10, 11 days away from family when you homeschool. Mm. It's, nope. this is not the trip so I, i'm coming home i'm not you know so that's just an example of like back in the day i'd be like i'm just gonna book it and play the dates and it's like no like i'm not gonna make a a 10-day trip is a big big difference in a 15-day trip yeah. so that's that's what's changed a little bit that's awesome. that's the balance <laughs> good and um yeah, and as a side note, I've I've heard rumors. I have not seen any uh, visual evidence of this yet. Uh, your wife is taller than you, so um, all, all mm -hmm. she she gets to gently put you in your place appropriately. So shall we say? <laughs> oh yeah, no, she's significantly taller than me. Okay. So much so that my twelve year old is my height. So wow, there you go. Humility comes in many forms. This is good, and it's usually for all of us married folk through our wives and our children. Oh yeah. When you're five foot five, you can't you can't get hung up on it. You kind of have to understand your place. Right. And uh, I just uh, I figured I'd marry up and then um, not you know free my children from the burden. Literally, literally yeah. marrying up. <laughs> yeah, she's my great height hope. I love like, it. I love uh, it. Yeah. Well, now uh, for all those hearing this, five foot five may not sound like, like much, but Mike has this, I don't know if we want to use the term lion within him. And when his voice comes out over that mm -hmm. uh, that microphone, it speaks volumes. So um, right. I thank you, Michael. Um, so last question for this, this segment, Mike, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you, get in touch with your music, uh, best way to follow you, all, all those things? Just search my name in any platform. Whatever you like to do, whether it's how you stream or how you follow, I'm there. Awesome. Wonderful. So just wonderful. Mike, Mike Mangione. Awesome. And so any, any Mike's uh, social media, please like, please follow and work there, doing great work there. Um, especially you can get to get to know and get to see Mike, uh, especially with um, the Made for More tour with Christopher West. Uh, and you guys are coming back to San Antonio in March, which I'm excited about. And um, and obviously for our work in the podcast, please like, share, uh, and get this message out. And now, Mike, for something completely different. So, Mike, I want to introduce you to what we call the 12, okay? And so these are uh, somewhat completely different from what we've, what we've been talking about. Um, I want you to simply kind of clear your head a little bit as much as you can and not, uh, not kind of first thing kind of comes to mind with these questions. Uh, it's to help our audience to get to know you just a okay. little bit more. Here. All right, ready? Well, just first thing, first thing that comes. First thing kind of comes out here. All right, number one, peanut butter, creamy or crunchy? Crunchy. Two, if you could be any Star Wars character, who would you be? Uh, probably the guy that says in Mandalorian that Nick Nolte does the voice for that says it is finished. Oh my I've, gosh. Spoke, I've spoken. I've spoken. I have spoken. Oh okay. man. Oh yes. Episode two of season one. Fantastic character. I totally forgot. Wow. Great choice there. Yes. I just feel like he was so, he figured something out in his life mm. and I, I want to get there at some point. And he had great mm. chops. He did. He did. Yeah. Uh, number three, uh, speaking of uh, desert, what is your desert Island food? Uh, probably chicken Parmesan. If mm. I can keep it fresh. Mm. <laughs> All right, we'll throw your refrigerator in there. You want otherwise chickens, chickens. Just chick, just give me chickens on the island. I'll be set. Exactly. Four yeah. beer or wine. Beer. Follow up. What kind? Uh, anything Belgium. Mm. Very good. Very good. Like Ooh. Belgium style. Yeah. Not from Belgium. Just yeah, like blue style. blue moon. Probably. Yeah, yeah, or like um uh uh, what's it called? Le Fin du Monde by Unibrew out of Can out of Montreal is uh, Quebec um, is just fantastic, but it's for Canadian. It's not Belgium. So, hey, but okay, it's not style, excellent. Okay, no, they're not a sponsor of the podcast, but go you can go check them out if you want. Or Dragon's Milk, Dragon's Milk by New Holland. 
I have to go check these out. You're giving me, uh, this is good. You're expanding my repertoire of music and brews and you can mm -hmm. do the two together, ladies and gentlemen. Um, just probably not while you're singing. Um, number five, uh, sings that we're in the Christmas season. Uh, what is your most memorable Christmas gift you received growing up? Most memorable Christmas gift was probably the GI Joe aircraft carrier when I was a kid. <sighs> yes, the 99 general flag. Totally, totally. That, yep. How big was that thing? Four feet? Uh, somewhere around four, four or five, but it was oh legit. Gosh. It oh, was yeah. to scale. So, you know, you, you, you talk about being busy. Like we would just play with that thing all day. Oh. All the day, yeah. yeah, and then and then you have the t and then also the other terror drone. I still remember that monstrosity as well. Very very good. Yeah. No, no we're 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 sharing. We're in the same same wavelength there. Um, yeah. Number six. Number six. Uh, bucket list country or city. I've always wanted to go to Russia, mm. and um, Japan. Mm. Beautiful. Been to Tokyo, but I didn't. Um, I didn't. I was at the airport, so that doesn't count. <laughs> you got to at least step outside. Yes. Yeah. Um, seven. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um. I, it's a toss-up. Uh, I think invisibility would be pretty great mm -hmm. because of because of the ways in which you could and that but it's there's a balance there because I would love to use it to help mm -hmm. but I also don't want to be sneaking around on people you know like Halloween. I, I you know it's like like for example like getting into the into the war room with Putin now I, I don't understand him but just those kind of scenarios where you can kind of put yourself to understand the mind of somebody so you can better a situation. But then again, it's like, <clears throat> that's manipulation. And that's not like, that's not very honest. So I'm torn. Uh, flying's pretty cool. <laughs> flying is probably the number one answer, but invisibility is coming on as number two. I'll, t I'll, I'll receive that. Yeah. Or like strength, you know, like having mm. like extreme strength. Just I'm trying to think of like positive. Like right away, I'm like, well, I'd love to, to be in, you know, um, eternal like not eternal but like indestructible and, and mm -hmm. go in harm's way and help but um i don't know i'm trying to balance like personal needs like i'd love to steal a bunch of stuff at a music store <laughs> maybe Cap i need bills. like a ton of money yeah a ton of money is a superpower i don't know <laughs> maybe maybe a maybe a doctorate is my superpower I, 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 was a, a <laughs> I have a doctorate doctor. ask me about my my uh my um oh gosh what is it um um, I'm blanking on the joke right now. Maybe it'll come back to me in a second, right? Okay. Um, Your bills? <laughs> Your well, tuition? It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the ones when you're a theological degree. Ask me about my, oh, there it is. Ask me about my STD. And no, it's, it's not sexually transmitted disease, yeah. my uh, licentiate or my uh, sacred theology degree. Uh, anyway, there's a joke for you, all you people. Um, number eight, have you seen The Chosen? I've seen almost through episode two. Of the first season. Sorry, season two. Almost through okay. season two. Okay, um, so from what you've seen, impossible mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite episode? Uh I like the episode of the paralytic at the at the bath. Mm. Where he says, follow me. And mm -hmm. uh and he starts the paralytic, he starts lamenting on how he just can't do it uh jesus asks if he wants help mm. and he just complains that he can't do it and then he looks at him and says you're not answering the question do you want me to help you basically um that was a big moment for me not to get in a whole new tangent but i had a moment like that when i was in the hospital in 2021 um with COVID, I had respiratory failure. I was like one mm. of the statistics that, you know, 40, 42 year old males, you know, th there's a period where the Delta was like, yeah, for some reason it's really bad on, you know, 42 year old males. Well, I was one of them. And so I was in the hospital for like 22 days and in the ICU. Mm. 
and I had a moment where I could see my, my, I, I kind of put together this little like intercessory team th that just to pray to pray with, mm -hmm. you know, in my time in need and John Paul II was one of them. And I had a moment where in my prayer, I could see him looking at me and he was just mm -hmm. staring at me and he was, <clears throat> he was very, um, the look on his face was, you know, he's, he emitted joy all the time. He's an actor, so he knew how to present himself. Uh, but occasionally you would see a look of concern when he wasn't like, when he wasn't like, like presenting, if he was just kind of a candid shot, he'd have this look. And that was the look he had. He was looking at me and he was a hundred percent John Paul II and a hundred percent Jesus in persona Christi, mm -hmm. like at the same time. And he says, do you want my help? And I said, like, all of a sudden, I understood that question in its entire weight. And I said, yes. And he said, then follow me. Or no, no, he said, then he said, then sit there, sit there. And I said, okay. And it was like my moment where he was like, do you fully accept me? That's mm -hmm. what he was asking. And I was like, yes. He's like, well, then do so. Got it. So that anyway, that was my favorite scene. Sorry, <laughs> tangent. Yeah, that was my favorite uh, episode. Beautiful, beautiful. And I encourage you. And you said uh, season two or season three? This was in season two. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So you, you're still, you're, you've begun in season three. Did I get that correct? We haven't started it yet. We, okay. we lost momentum for no, not, nothing to do with the show, just okay. family momentum. Sure. But we, sure. we got to start it back up again. Okay. I encourage you to keep going, uh, yeah. especially season three, episode two, has something very profound in it. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, well, it's all all lots of fun, but but especially there. Yeah. Um, I read the book, so I'm, I'm I feel like I know the story. <laughs> Good, and I kind of know the author a little bit. It's a little bit. Right. Yeah, um, um, a lot of fan letters to him. <laughs> exactly. Um, number nine. Besides your name and date, what do you want written on your tombstone? Um, you know. I never really thought of that before. I guess um, it's not very original. Father and husband is good, but um, the classics are good. Yeah. Uh, I my my license plate that I always wanted to get was uh, "I'm late," <laughs> but you just do like "I am space L eight right? I'm late." Uh, and I always thought that'd be good because I'm speeding all the time. Uh, but that's the first thing that popped my head. I'm late. <laughs> or maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe like, uh, like Gandalf, you, you're not, you're not early nor late. You're just right on time. So just right on time. I'm finally on time. I made <laughs> finally, it. I, I made it there. That, maybe that's it. Right. And, and actually that fits with, um, trying to make the show. I finally made it. How about. Uh, okay, how about this? Michael Anthony Mangione, July 11th, 1979, to whatever. And then in quotes says, I beat you here. <laughs> yes. As it is said, it shall be do As it is written, it is, is said uh, or done. Whatever. I won. I won. I'm, a, I'm the winner. I'm a winner. <laughs> <laughs> Winning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, mm -hmm. number ten. If you had to pick a favorite saint, who would it be? Okay, well, jump all two just jumps right, but so mm -hmm. I'm trying to get beyond that. Um, mm -hmm. Favorite saint. I've always appreciated Padre Pio's mm -hmm. demeanor. He often looks like how I feel. Mm. <laughs> he just looks like uncomfortable and like hot and just like, um, like he's, uh, he's thinking about something else. Obviously he was, but mm. that just, the, just his, you know, okay. No, all jokes aside. I love, because he kind of has a reputation for being um, not a hard ass, but like curmudgeon. Yeah. 
And I love that because mm -hmm. I don't feel, I feel like that so much. Mm -hmm. And it's just nice to know. Now, obviously you can't like glorify that and you can't like, uh, but it, it goes back to our understanding our weaknesses mm -hmm. and using our weaknesses to be the, the entryway in which God can come in and radiate, you know, and it also goes to tie it kind of all back together. Like, you know, learning that it's okay in Catholic and Christian music, it's okay in Christian music to not be praising all the time. It's okay to be lamenting. It's okay to be reflecting and, and gasping and, and being primal as long as you're involved in that conversation, right? As long as you're trying to like engage that conversation. And I think there's a part of me that thought you needed to be like whitewashed tombs all the time to show that you have the faith and that you're joyful. And that's just not the reality. And that's what I love about being Catholic is I love, we have moments of quiet. We have moments of candle. We have moments of incense and kneeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just feel like Padre Pio, you know, so many saints you look at, you're like, wow, they're like otherworldly. But he, I understand, I feel like I understand him. And yet he had spiritual gifts that are otherworldly. <laughs> you know, like he, he was literally just like bleeding out of his body. And, you know, as they say, like bilocating. But but even when he was, you know, I love the story that he bilocated to like slap a woman in confession. <laughs> <laughs> like I can hang with that guy. I'm not saying that that's right, but I can handle that guy. Okay, you know, so just, when, when he when he says to me, you know, and I really just kind of <laughs> wanted to slap him, I'd be like, I know what you mean. I understand that. Did you? Because you didn't. And he's like, no, no, I did. I did. I bilocated and I slapped him. Hey, if like, it's good enough for, for St. Nicholas, it's good enough for Padre Pio, and it's good enough for Mike Mangio. That's right. St. Nicholas is another one who I was like, mm -hmm. I, I get that guy. Was he, had he, was he drinking a little bit? Was he, <laughs> well, at the council, we're not sure. The, the rumor is it was a good, ba good Belgian ale. Um, but I'm, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that to, uh, hey. maybe St. Bridget, the patron saint of beer. That's what I like to call her. Won't be the first time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, beautiful answer. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, number 11, if you had to be martyred, how would you want to go out? Uh, on I was going to say either on stage mm. or, or similarly uh, at mass. Mm. I think that's a good answer. Or it'd be cool to put it to use and save somebody. That'd be kind mm. of fun. You know, like if there was like a dramatic, like the gun comes out and I do like this thing and it, for whatever reason, it's in slow motion. And <laughs> And I take the bullet and as I'm going, you kind of see me look down and like, like acknowledge what happened, but then like, let it go and look up and just kind of give it. And then everybody's like, wow, that was like the perfect martyrdom. And then the guys, per the, whoever the shooter is taken care of. Yeah, yeah. But, but people saw me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have I have a feeling I don't know if you know any comic book artists. Somebody should create that story right there. That's that's, that's I do actually. I know a well, guy that and he's going to get on it. I think yeah, I think he should. I think it's good. Or and it's kind of like Bill and Ted. Uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. The music saves the universe. Same kind of thing here, Mike. Congratulations, you've, yeah. you've made it. Glad I could be so, part of that. Number twelve. You kind of hinted it on this last question, but I want to. I want to go full full throttle on here, um, Mike. Why be Catholic? Oh, well, you got to be something. <laughs> why? Why Catholic? Well, there's so many reasons. Um, so many reasons. Uh, apostolic succession, um, the, the history, the documentation, um, the wisdom. I, I like, um, you know, in talking about, kind of talking about this conversation, I like to put it like, you know, if I'm going to learn an instrument, mm -hmm. do I want 
to learn an instrument from a guy who just started yesterday? Do I want to sit down at the piano and try to figure it out myself? Mm. Or do I want to get the book of the classics and have them teach me the, the ways in which people have pondered it for thousands of years? Mm. <laughs> hey, this is what the instrument is. This is how the sound works. This is how the physics works. This is the theory behind it. Uh, just, you know, like that's the reasonable choice. So for me, if I'm going to enter into that question of what it means to be human, I want to do it with people that have been at it for thousands of years. And the older faiths, the older traditions um, supply that. I, we, I have a friend who I can't remember the specific example, but she's, she's devout in her faith. Uh, she's not Catholic. And she had um, a realization that she was ex excited to share that she had come to, and it was it was Aquinas, mm. and I was like, "That's that's absolutely right on," and mm. Aquinas talks about that in his book. You know, like I just love that we have that. That's the lineage that we come from, that we can learn and build from. Um, so that's that's another reason, but also uh, for me, the tan it's so tangible, the mm. phys like the incarnation. Physical, like with music, physical things uh, revealing a spiritual reality. Um, you know, we started off, what, what's, what is music? Music is something fun to do with the air, something interesting to do with the air. You're taking something invisible mm. and you're, you're, you're adding, you're giving visibility to it through the vibration of string, through the movement of, of mm. uh, a body and you're, you, and it's having in a physiological impact on you that to me the tangibility and the sacramentality of the catholic faith uh, mm. does the same thing it takes the spiritual world that i just can't totally grasp and it gives physical qualities to them that all point back to the spiritual world. that's what the sacramentality the sacraments are so i love that um, and then, of course, the real presence. Like, if I believe in, if the God I believe in is the God I believe in, mm -hmm. then physically being present in the Eucharist shouldn't be a question. It shouldn't be a question at all. So, you know, the, the, um, well, I just have a hard time with the presence in the bread and wine. It's like, well, then you have a hard time with God, the concept of God, mm -hmm. because the concept of God <laughs> lends itself very easily to bread and wine. <laughs> So, um, yeah, those are all reasons that I just feel like it's an old myth that I just, when I put on, I just, I understand completely. I, I, I must comment on, thank you. Thank you for articulating this. And, and just uh, the, the one commentary, and I think it, if we, we've, we brought this conversation to a beautiful close for the moment, because um, we talked about how music, we do need to study the masters. We do need to understand what are those, what are those perimeters? What are those boundaries that music works? And then in cultivating that craft, then we're able to enter into that to create something new, a participation. In it. And it's not a destruction uh, or a derivation from, uh, of the, the, the source, but it's that healthy development that comes in there. So another way to put it is, learn this craft well, learn to play the instrument of our bodies well, to live this life that God gives us well. And we just might find at the end of our life to be able to add one note to the beautiful score that we call redemption. It's a beautiful thing. Can I, that's a beautiful yeah. wrap up. Yeah. So many pops in my head. There's an artist named Glenn Gould who I absolutely mm. love. And Glenn Gould is a, a progeny progeny prodigy prodigy um uh genius piano player uh all all that whole yeah when he was young he was playing brilliantly that kind of story that we've heard before um he was a master at piano but he was an eccentric uh probably on the spectrum to some degree and he, he his era was like 40s to 6 70s and um hmm. technically he could he could go up against anybody he died in like the 80s i think he can go up against anybody 
But really what made him separate him from everybody else was his flaws. He mm-hmm. would, first off, only use the children's stool. So where most people play piano with their arms at a certain angle, he played piano like this because he was the stool was so short. But he like he wanted to be right with the keys. So he would like he like wa- if you just Google videos yeah. of Glenn Gould, you see him and he's constantly he's his body is just he can't control his body as he's playing, and he would often sing with the notes. He would sing with his playing, even on recordings. So when they're doing professional recordings with microphones, you can hear his voice humming. Okay. So, to, and I'll even go a step further. Hmm. He would oftentimes change a little bit of the music. He was a master of Bach, but he would sometimes change hmm. what was written by Bach. And when asked about it, he, fe- he said, because I feel like this is how Bach would want it played. Wow. Okay. So he got so much crap from his contemporaries like he was like blasphemous like mm. how dare you play what was written for a harpsichord like that on a, on a piano a can you still hear me i can hear you okay okay um but what they didn't see though because they're so focused on the ways in which he was failing like falling short they didn't see what he was at like his actual performance which was like angelic is one person is quoted saying i believed in the existence of god when i watched glenn gould play because he was transcending into a place that they were completely unfamiliar with Hmm. glenn gould was a vocal atheist so the fact that a vocal atheist Hmm. through his his expression and complete openness to vulnerability was able to tap into a transcendent performance that made audience members believe in God. It's a pretty beautiful thing. So, yes, our brokenness and our the way in, ways in which we're we're fallen are not meant to be celebrated. They're meant to be glorified mm. by the Creator. And if we set ourselves and transform, mm. if we set ourselves on a journey of of searching, excavating and and leaning into that reality then we will be on a path of righteousness a path of faith a path of being led by a god who was nailed to a tree michael um mike mangione uh, thank you for your yes to developing your gifts and sharing these gifts with the world Uh, The world is a better place and individuals who exist on this plane of reality are better for it. And I can say I'm one of them. So thank you for sharing your gifts. Um, Please don't go away. I'm going to just um, close up here uh, with all our guests. But Mike, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, And uh, I hope that you were genuinely moved uh, from that conversation uh, with Mike Mangione. Again, MikeMangione.com. Uh, check out his music, any any of his social media. Um, and if you have the opportunity, um, go check out Made for More. Uh, you can find that information at the Theology of the Body Institute um, website. Uh, go to these, uh, these um, they're not performances. They're, they're, I don't know, live theater. More, more, more than that, experiences that can really change your life. And Mike is a, certainly an impactful part of that work, an essential part, I would argue. So, um, and I encourage all of you, uh, if you like what you heard here, please like, please share, click the bell uh, if it has one um, and get the word out because the work we're doing is critically important. If you feel impelled uh, to want to support the work we do here at the Redeemed Vision Podcast, we have a Freedom Coaching Foundation. Uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit that allows you to, to make a tax deductible donation to the work we're doing so we can continue to spread the word uh, even more on what we're doing here um, to set the blind free from darkness. If you are, uh, and, and to find out more about the work we do, check out freedom-coaching.net. And remember, nothing is wasted. Everything is redeemable. And may everything we do give glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, world without end. Amen. God bless you all. And until next time, I'm Steve Picorni. Blessings.
The Redeemed Vision Podcast is an outreach of Freedom Coaching. To learn more, check out freedom-coaching.net and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Movie.